Hello, everyone. Welcome to another video on OpenSys modeling. Um, so before starting with this video and with this exercise, uh, I just want to recap in the last four videos um, that I recorded for you. Um, we built a steel moment resisting frame uh, considering a both uh, distributed plasticity approach, in this case for the columns, and lumped uh, plasticity approach for the beams. Uh, it was a 2D model, and we did a pushover analysis, a model analysis, gravity analysis, and also uh, a small time history analysis. Um, so if you haven't watched those videos, it is convenient that you go to those videos first, have a look, and then come uh, to these videos as some of the things that were already mentioned in those initial four videos are not going to be repeated here. It's just going to be assumed that you know these topics. Um, to be honest, they are not super hard, so probably you can just go through this video and then if, if you get stuck at some point, just be aware that you might find the answer in any of the videos before. So today we're going to build a new OpenSys model. In this case, uh, I wanted to change a little bit the exercise um, to provide you with um, more tools to continue building your models. In this case, we're going to be working uh, with a reinforced concrete frame. Um, and it's going to be a 3D frame rather than a 2D frame like in the other case. So um, let me just show you. This is the model that we're going to be building. As you can see, it's very simple. We have a, just one span on each direction. The X and the Y direction are considered to be uh, the two horizontal directions in our model, while the Z direction is going to be the vertical direction in the model. As you can see, um, unlike the other model that we built before, this one has only one story um, because I didn't want to complicate it too much. Another difference is that we are not going to model uh, lumped plasticity in this case. Although you can also do it just like we did in the in the first uh, model in the case of the um, of the uh, steel moment resisting frame. In this case, it's going to be distributed plasticity in the columns and distributed plasticity in the beams. Obviously, this has advantages and disadvantages that we'll be discussing through the videos. So, like I said, one story, reinforced concrete moment resisting frame. Uh, we have uh, the concrete that we're going to use is 25 to 28 megapascals, uh, in a specific 25 megapascals for um, the concrete that is not confined, so uh, let's say the concrete in the cover outside of the main uh, rebars, and 20, uh, 28 megapascals for the concrete that is actually confined by the steel ropes. Uh, we're going to use uh, rebar FY, the strength is going to be 420 megapascals. Um, just bear in mind, these two numbers are not particularly corresponding to any commercial um, uh, concrete or steel. However, they are, they are very close to the commercial um, uh, values that you will find in the materials. Um, the rebars that we're going to be using, we're going to use just one kind of rebar for simplicity reasons. That is going to be a 25 millimeters uh, diameter um, uh, steel bar. And like I said, both beams and columns are going to be modeled as a distributed plasticity um, uh, model. Our final goal is to do a nonlinear dynamic analysis or time history, both in X and Y direction. Uh, also, at this step, we're going to do it uh, first in X and then in Y uh, individually. So there won't be any simultaneous um, earthquakes applied on, on, on both directions. Although this is something that can be easily done and probably you can just figure it out by yourself. Uh, in order to reach to the time history, I'm going to do also the checks in uh, modal gravity and pushover just for sanity reasons to understand how this frame is working. The units that we will be using are kilonewton, uh, meter, and second. Um, so before going to the model, I would just like to um, give you a brief or introduction to the materials that we will be using. In this case, unlike uh, the steel moment resisting frame, uh, we have, like I said, a concrete material. This means that this material is mainly working in compression while in tension the resistance uh, or the capacity in tension is uh, almost negligible. We will see some of the numbers later. 
And then this is the shape that the concrete material is going to follow, while the steel uh, reinforcement is going to follow this path that you can see here. This is going to be the strain-stress relationship, and this is obviously working both in compression and in tension. Uh, in order to model these behaviors, uh, a typical approach is to use the concrete 02 and the steel 02. These are often used uh, together, but obviously there are many other materials in the open seas that um, you can use for this purpose. So now, uh, hands on to our uh, model. This is, I'm going to be describing the model uh, just briefly. I'm going to try to go fast. Uh, because this is something that you already know how it works. I'm just going to mainly focus on the differences between the 2D, the 3D frame, and also the steel to the concrete frame. So the first thing that you will notice is that uh, when we're building the model, instead of using um, two dimensions, we're using three dimensions, the 3D model. And obviously, as a consequence of the three dimensions, we're using six degrees of freedom, three uh, different displacements uh, in the three axes, and three rotations along this axis as well. Um, remember that the order of these uh, degrees of freedom is actually something that you will be assigning when you, when you build your model. Uh, so what I'm going to do is the first three for me are going to be the displacements in X, Y, and Z respectively, while the last three are going to be the rotation uh, along the X, Y, and Z axis respectively. So um, the global geometry for this exercise is going to be the span in X is going to be six meters. The span in Y is going to be seven meters. And the story height is going to be 3.5 meters. In this case, just one story height. So I have to define now the grids in the three dimensions. So for X, I have a zero and X uh, zero plus uh, the span in X, the same for Y and the same for Z. Um, so basically I just have zero and six 0 and 7, and 0 and 3.5. I just did it this way because you know I love assigning variables for some reason. So um, this is just, let's say, to, to make it clearer. You can just go straight to define the nodes uh, without having to define the variables, and it wouldn't change anything. And just because I like to define a lot of variables, uh, I did it also for, uh, for the nodes. So I have the nodes in the base are these four here, A, B, C, and D. Um, they correspond to one, two, three, and four in the tags. And the ones on the top of the building, let's say the nodes where the beams and the columns are going to connect, are these four that you can see down here. Um, these axes A, B, C, and D, they correspond to the same ones that we have in the presentation. As you may remember, A, B and the, are the ones, let's say, in the front, while C and D are the ones in the back. So coming back to my model, uh, in this case, uh, when I define the nodes, I have already defined a lot of tags, but when I define the nodes themselves and I use the node comment, uh, I'm going to use obviously the, the tags first, that's the first um, argument that I'm going to put. But in this case, the coordinates, instead of having only two coordinates, like in the model that we did before, I'm going to have three coordinates in order to account also for the position in set. Uh, so I have one, two, three values. Uh, for each of these nodes, and they are just located where they are supposed to be. Uh, I'm not assigning the mass directly in the node. This is an option that you have. You can assign the mass directly in the nodes from the definition, but you can also uh, add them later. It's up to you, and it's completely and exactly the same. Uh, now, for the restraints, I'm going to fix um, the first four nodes, so the base. And as you can see, instead of fixing it in three degrees of freedom, I am actually fixing it in six degrees of freedom. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six values. Remember that the one means fix, while the zero means uh, pinned or release in that uh, degree of freedom. It can be a displacement or, rot or rotation. In this case, I'm just I have just chosen to have everything fixed, both in displacements and in rotations. Now, for the constraints, I don't have any real constraints. I don't know if you remember, but in the last model, I was defining some constraints because I had some zero length uh, elements that were um, connecting the beams to the plastic hinges. Uh, and the, since I did that, I had to find a way to also connect the, the rest of the degrees of freedom, and that's why I defined some constraints. In this case, I don't need any of them because here the elements are just connected one directly to the other. 
Um, now, let's go to the materials and let's just try to spend a few minutes on here because this is important. So I have to define three materials, uh, the unconfined concrete, the confined concrete, and the reinforce reinforcement steel. I have assigned these three names just because uh, they are handy. However, just bear in mind, in this case, I'm going to use the same materials for the beams and the columns. However, uh, I mean, this uh, the advantage of confining uh, brought by the stirrups is often used in the columns. Normally, it's neglected in the beams, so you can just make the difference. If you want, you can just create different materials if, it's, if it fits your problem, or you can just keep uh, the same materials for beams and columns. Also, it is a common approach to, to use uh, lumped plasticity for beams, just because uh, the fiber-based uh, elements, they normally take more... Uh, computational effort than the lump plasticity approach, and that's why uh, they are often used. Uh, in addition, there are other advantages of the lump plasticity in comparison uh, to the distributed plasticity um, that I will mention uh, in a minute. So, for the parameters of the materials, uh, I am defining, like I said, two different concretes. In this case, one represents the unconfined, as you can see here in my comment. Remember, important to comment your uh, models and your, your code because otherwise you will forget. Sooner or later you will forget. And um, the second concrete is going to be the one for the confined uh, space. I want you to notice that I'm using a minus sign because I'm trying to represent the compression and compression is normally uh, at a, or is related to a reduction in the, in the length of the element. And that is why I have to use it with a minus sign. Uh, now, this, this is the value of epsilon. So the strain at the maximum stress in compression, that's why it's also negative. Uh, this is just a conventional value. Uh, obviously, all of these are just values that I'm using. Uh, they are not coming from any code. This is going to depend on your project. Um, and then I'm using also the, the ultimate stress for both uh, concretes. I'm just considering that 20% of the uh, of the F, F, FC is going to be the FU or the ultimate stress for both the unconfined and the confined concrete. But this again depends on your project. And then also the ultimate strain or the strain at the ultimate stress in compression that I just consider that is going to be 10 times larger than this one here, just because uh, that's what fits my uh, requirements. So all these values can be observed in the materials that I showed you before. Um, as you might remember, uh, this is um, my first epsilon. This is my second epsilon. Uh, we have also uh, the F uh, apostrophe C or um, the, the maximum value, the FC, and we have the FU. And this is basically the lambda. It's going to be just a reloading stiffness in relationship with the original uh, stiffness, or in this case, Jung's modulus, because I'm talking at a stress and material uh, level. So coming back to my uh, materials, um, I have also the uh, characteristics for for this. Sorry, uh, I have also the characteristics for this material in um, tension. As you remember, I told you that the tension capacity was significantly or is normally significantly smaller in concrete. So I'm considering 10% uh, of the compression capacity uh, and I'm adding this minus sign because since it was originally minus then times minus is going to be plus. So basically it's going to be a positive value that will be equivalent to 10% of FC. And then I also have to assign the elastic modulus uh, or the stiffness depending on a uh, if you're using a, a, a material level or an element level definition of a material. Um, so in this case, I'm just going to define it as the elastic modulus that is just uh, the maximum capacity divided by 0 0.002. And this is just something that I decided to assign uh, as a choice. Now, for compression, we haven't assigned the, the value of E in compression, but it's not really necessary because we have given every single other value. And with the rest of the values that we have already given, particularly these three, uh, the program automatically can uh, de define what will be the Jung's modulus or the stiffness, depending on what you are inputting in your material. So no need to do it. Now, uh, with respect to the 
uh, rebars with the steel reinforcement, I am using FY of 420,000 uh, kilopascals. Uh, that's why I'm adding three zeros because it's kilopascals. Uh, same case with the Jung's modulus, that is going to be 210 million uh, kilopascals. Um, then uh, for the strain hardening ratio, that is basically uh, the ratio between the hardening after the yielding and before the yielding, I'm going to choose 0 0.005, um, that is equivalent to half percent. And this is probably close to the typical values that are uh, used in, in literature. Um, but obviously this is something that you have to adjust also to your own materials. Now, these last three values, uh, these R0, CR1, and CR2, they will define the smoothness of the transition between the elastic and the plastic uh, part of the material. Just to show you again in the, in the presentation, briefly to show you. So it's basically going to define how smooth this curve is going to be here. So the recommended values uh, by the open and the material itself are actually these ones that you can see here, uh, R0 10 to 20, uh, CR1 0 0.925 and CR2 0 0.15. And I invite you to play with them with the different numbers to see how um, the, the material is going to change. You can just do it with a very simple script just causing or inducing some cyclic uh, behavior just to see how it be, uh, behaves or just a, a monotonic push as well. So I'm going to now define the materials, basically just putting all of these uh, variables that I have defined. Uh, the concrete zero 02 requires uh, these uh, input arguments. As you can see, they are here already. They have been from here, put from here to here. And for the steel 0 02, I'm doing exactly the same. I'm just neglecting these uh, values that are optional. I'm not using those values. Now, um, for the sections, and this is uh, also an important bit that I have to spend a few minutes. So I'm going to define only two sections, uh, just because this is a simple model. Obviously, it will depend on your case. You might have many columns, many beams. In my case, I'm going to define a column that is 300 by 400 millimeters and a beam that is 300 by 600 millimeters. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm just defining pi in order to uh, be more accurate with the definition of the area of the rebar. So the definition, the area of the rebar is going to be pi times the diameter to the square divided by four. Um, the base of the column is uh, 30 centimeters or 0 0.3 meters. Remember, my model is given in meters, so that's why I'm using meters. H of the column is going to be 40, as you remember. Uh, R is the, the cover of the column, and I'm going to have 4 centimeters. And for the beam, similarly, I'm going to use the same numbers, except that I'm going to use 0 0.6 for the H. Now, um, at this point, as you might remember, in the beams, I was building my fiber-based uh, uh, model, sorry, elements, by using a small procedure called W section uh, that is actually provided in one of the tutorials that uh, the people of OpenSys have kindly provided. Well, there is a similar one to build uh, concrete sections. This is obviously entirely optional. You can just do it yourself and you can define the patches and you can define the layers or whatever you have to add. But we're going to use this uh, in particular. And let me just uh, show you. So this is the script that we're going to use. Um, and this was uh, developed by Professor Michael Scott and then modified by uh, Professor Silvia Mazzoni. Uh, who, by the way, uh, have, has a really good tutorial. Uh, she has a website and a channel in YouTube, so I advise you to go and have a look because they have a lot of very, very valuable material, uh, particularly for more advanced users, as these tutorials are very, very basic. Um, they actually talk about more uh, advanced topics that you might be interested on. So basically, these are the input uh, values that we need for this for this uh, procedure. So we have the ID of the section, uh, the dimensions, the cover, both in uh, in H and B direction, um, the material for the core, the material for the cover, the material for the steel, uh, the number of bars on the top. So basically, if this is the section, as you can see, they illustrated the section very nicely here. These bars that you can see up here, um, the material 
yeah. of the sorry the number of the, the area of the of the bars on the top so the area of each of these bars on the top then we have the numbers of bars in the bottom so basically these bars here as they can be different from the top uh, the area of the uh, bars in the bottom then we have um, the number of bars uh, in the intermediate part in total so basically it's the sum of these ones in the middle and these ones in the middle um, that's why it says total and the, the area of each of these bars and then finally uh, we have four parameters that are going to define the number of fibers that we need uh, on each direction so these two are for the core and these two are for uh, the, uh, the, the, the cover of the section. Uh, bear in mind that this script is considering that the cover of the section we already have two uh, layers uh, of fibers or two fibers in one direction and then the number that you define in the other. So that two is pretty much already defined. You can change it here as well because if you want to have a look in the model, you will notice that these two that I'm mentioning is right here and right here. Uh, so basically, I'm defining the, the, the core by using a patch, a very simple rectangular patch uh, that I am defining the, the, the location of my different points and also the number of fibers that I want on either, each direction. I'm also defining four different uh, patches for the cover. And here's a very nice illustration that they left for us. So basically this is the first definition and then these four things on the on the corners as you can see there are like trapezoids they are defined by these four patches uh, they are not particularly rectangular they are just uh, uh, they have four sides but they are not necessarily rectangular actually they are not rectangular and then finally the rebars they are defined as layers so we have four layers we have uh, the layer for the top the layer for the bottom so basically the steel here and the steel here and then we have the intermediate uh, uh, reinforcement that we will have in the in the in the middle part of the of the sections. So basically, these four here, but it's already divided by two. So it's already considering only one side or the other because we divide we divided it by two in here. Okay. So I'm not going to go too much in depth with this uh, script. You can have a look in your own time. Uh, this is publicly available on uh, in one of the of the resources that OpenSea offers. So I advise you to Google the name of this um, of this file, and you will find where it's coming from and the models that they have offered for us. And uh, in particularly for our model, I would just like to uh, focus on very important things. The first one is the local access, and this is going to be particularly important for this. Uh, model because the local axis will define what is the orientation of our section within the 3D uh, frame. So I want you to notice that there is a Y and a Z axis. Uh, they are represented with lowercase y and lowercase z, unlike the global axis that I represented with uppercase x, y, and z. So um, where is the x? Well, the x is actually along the axis of this uh, element. So basically the X is going to be in the direction that you define this element. If you define it from node one to two, then the, the vector that is formed from uh, node one to two is going to be actually the vector lowercase x or local x for your element. So going back to my code, um, you will notice that I'm obviously calling this file because I need to let the OpenSys know that I will need the procedure that is contained in this file. And then after that, I'm going to use the procedure itself. That's why I'm calling the procedure here. And I'm just defining every single one of the, uh, of the arguments that are needed for this procedure. In this case, I'm defining, for example, only eight uh, fibers on each uh, for the core and also for the cover, just because I don't want to go too much in detail because also it makes it slower. And then there are problems also um, with, the, with the capacity of the computers. And I think eight is uh, more than accurate for my current purpose um, and then you can see that every single other um, element is already input here i want to give you a a, a glimpse of how it looks uh, physically so what i did is i just put it in my presentation as well and you will notice that these are my two sections and the most important thing that you have to notice is the local axis as you can see 
using the definition that I used in, in this file, and like you saw before, uh, my y-axis is in the long direction. Let's say it's in the vertical direction for the section, looking it like this in the in the in the PowerPoint. And the set direction is uh, let's say in the short in the short dimension of the section or horizontally in this particular uh, PowerPoint. The same thing for the beam. As you can see, this is the distribution of the steel, and this is the distribution of the sections. Uh, I'm using a cover of uh, four centimeters in every single case. Now, why is this important? Well, because the next part uh, that I have to do is, I have to define the transformation. As you might remember, when we use the transformation parameters in the 2D frame, we just cared about if it was either uh, considering the P-delta effects or if it was not considering the P-delta effects. In this case, when we're using a 3D model, we have to be a little bit more specific. We will define not only whether it's considering the P-delta effects or not, but we will also have to consider uh, what is the orientation of this section with respect to the global axis. And how is this done? And this is probably something that is, um, or tends to be quite confusing. Uh, well, this is basically the way it's done. And let me uh, be a little bit more um, specific with this part. So let's start with the column. You will notice that this is my column. The way I define, or I will actually define it in a minute in the model, is going from this node in the bottom to this node in the top. That means that automatically the x-axis is going from here to here. So my x-axis is already fixed and is going to be defined by the nodes, the, the start and the end node of my element. And you cannot change it. It's just there. Now, the section, depending on what is the orientation that I want for this section, I will have to rotate the Z and the Y. Now, for this specific example, I want to have the strong axis or the strong uh, section in the long span. As you remember, it is seven meters in this direction, in Y, in global Y, and it's six meters in global X or this direction. Now, um, how do you do it or how do you define it? Um, a very simple way to put it is, you're going to use the coordinates in your transformation, as you can see, there is a vector here, a vector here, and a vector here. That are basically the coordinates. And these coordinates in X, Y, and Z, so basically the vector local X, Z with respect to global X, the vector uh, or the plane that is uh, uh, conformed by X, Z in the direction of uh, global Y, and the same thing in X set in the direction of set. This sounds very complicated, that tends to be very confusing, but a very simple way to, to put it is locate your local Z axis, okay? So where do you want this local Z axis to be oriented on? Well, I want it to be oriented, for example, for the column. As you might remember, I want the strong axis to be uh, or the strong section to be for the long span, which means that my weak section, in this case, uh, uh, the, the shortest uh, dimension is pointing at the same direction that local set, is going to be in the same direction than global X. Now, this means that my local set has to match to my global X. How do, how do I do that? Well, by using these coordinates. Uh, by using these coordinates. X, this is global X. I want it to be matching with, and this is all in terms of the local set, with minus one local set. So as you can see, local set is pointing in the same direction as global X, but in the same uh, axis and global X, but in the different direction. In this case, it's going to the left instead of going to the right. That's why I use minus one. Now, what happens if I use one instead of minus one? Well, exactly the same. The only thing is that Z would be pointing to the right. And since I have to respect the, the rule of the right hand, 
then my y, instead of pointing in plus y, it will be pointing in uh, minus global y. So basically this y would be pointing the other way around. Now, is this an issue? Not in this model, because my section is symmetrical. I have the same reinforcement on this side than on this side. But in the case that you have different reinforcement here and here, then uh, it actually matters if you use minus one or one, okay? For this case, it doesn't matter. I just wanted to uh, give you an example with a minus or with a plus. So I just put minus one, and that means that my column is oriented like this, okay? Now, for the, for the beams in X, in global X, this is a beam in global X. Uh, we know that we are, or we will see that we are defining it from this node to this node, which means that my X vector is always going from here to here. And this one cannot be changed. It's already defined by the definition of my element. Now, uh, my local axis, Y and Z, I know that they correspond to the strong direction and the weak direction. And obviously I want my columns, sorry, my beams to be working in the strong direction for bending. Uh, I don't want them to be strong, to work in the strong direction for, for a horizontal moment, let's say, or for a, a moment coming from a horizontal force. So um, I have to define it uh, with Y going vertically, and that is for sure. And either it could, be, it can, it could go to the top or to the bottom, it doesn't really matter. So that means that my set has to go uh, in the horizontal direction. Now, this set direction, lower capital set, matches the global Y. That means that the value that I'm going to use here is a one. Finally, for the beams in the Y direction, same case. I won't repeat everything, but since I want my set to be oriented in the same direction as my global X, I'm going to put a one here. Now, what happens if I put minus one and minus one here? Exactly the same case, because like I said, doesn't matter because I have the same reinforcement on the top and the bottom. It's just going to be turned the other way around, but it's symmetrical, doesn't really matter. It would matter if I had a different reinforcement in the top and the bottom. So I would have to be careful to either use one or minus one in these cases. Now, be very careful here, because for example, for this beam uh, that is oriented in the X direction, if for some reason I decide to put that Z is equal to global X, so basically one, zero, zero, I'm going to get an error because my Z cannot be oriented. Let me rephrase that. My local Z cannot be oriented in the same direction than my local X. They have to be uh, in a different direction as uh, the X is going to be always fixed, defined by the element starting and ending node, okay? In the same way, I wouldn't be able to define this second beam with 0, 1, 0, because then I would get an error, okay? So just be very careful on how you define the beams, and this is why I'm defining different beams for X and Y. Now, this is reflected here, exactly like I said, with the same numbers. I am considering the p-delta effects for the columns, not for the beams, just for illustration purposes. The number of integration points along the elements, I'm using eight integration points. And then I'm defining the columns very similarly how I defined them in the, in the first tutorials. I'm not going to go too much in depth with this. And the same case with the beams. In this case, as you can see, the beams are defined from node to node on the top, and they are going from left to right. And let's say, uh, looking at this, from A to C and from B to D. As you can see here, from A to C and from B to D. Now, um, and obviously the transformation here is very important. These two are uh, using the tag of the beams in X and these two are using the tag of the beams in Y, just to make sure that I don't get any errors. So um, at this point, the only thing that is missing is to add the gravity loads. Uh, and the masses. So for the gravity loads, I'm just assigning uh, a gravity load of 80 kilonewtons at each node. Um, there are two things that I want you to notice. The first thing is, um, instead of having three coordinates here, or three numbers, I have six. And it's actually because these represent the degrees of freedom. So these are the loads applied in the different degrees of freedom. Like I said, I have three displacements, and then I have also 
uh, three uh, rotations. So these three displacements are going to represent a force. These ones are going to represent a moment. Um, these forces here are oriented in the global X, the global Y, and the global Z. And since they are, I want them to be in the direction of the gravity, these are gravity loads, then I'm using minus the value of C, or CL, sorry. So in this case, it's going downwards. It's just uh, in the same direction than the gravity. That's the first thing. The second thing that I want you to notice is that I am not assigning any distributed load like I did before in the, uh, in the steel moment resisting frame. And this is because I cannot add distributed loads on uh, fiber based elements, uh, at least not distributed loads that are uh, perpendicular or that are going to cause a shear on the element. And this is basically because these elements do not have any shear capacity. When I was mentioning that there are some advantages and disadvantages of using either the concentrated plasticity or the distributed plasticity, this is precisely what I meant. One of the main disadvantages of using the distributed plasticity is that these sections, they only have axial capacity. In consequence, they also have flexural capacity, right? Because it's at the end, the result of compression and tension. Uh, however, they don't have any capacity in shear in any of the two directions, nor torsion. So that is definitely going to affect the capacity of these elements. Now, how can you address this issue? Well, the first approach that you can use is you just go to the, to the concentrated plasticity approach, which allows you to use uh, uh, just regular uh, elements, normally elastic elements, uh, and then constraints in order to transfer the loads, in this case, the, the shear loads and the torsional loads um, from the structure to the element that you're, you're analyzing. Um, however, the problem with this is that we will lose the advantage of the distributed plasticity that is precisely to explicitly account for the interaction between the flexural and the actual uh, effects. Now, another way to address this issue is to use something called the section aggregator. The section aggregator, uh, I'm not going to go in depth with it. Uh, you can Google it and you will find some references of, about it in, in the documentation of OpenSys. The section aggregator basically is going to add a parallel uh, action to the same element. So you can use, for example, a section aggregator for giving resistance, stiffness and resistance or strength and stiffness in the shear uh, X local axis. Uh, you can do the same for the shear Z local axis, and you can do the same for the torsion. So bear in mind, you can add these effects by using the section aggregator. Not going to be explicitly modeled here. I'm just going to go with this uh, simplified uh, fiber model. So that's why I'm not adding uh, distributed loads because I don't have a capacity to withstand shear loads in my elements as they are modeled as distributed, distributed plasticity. Now, I'm finally adding the masses. Like I told you, you can add them in the original uh, definition of the nodes, or you can simply go and add them at the end. It's up to you, it's just a choice. Uh, I just want you to notice something that both, uh, or equally, just like we did in the loads that we have six degrees of freedom, is the same case for the masses. There are six degrees of freedom for the masses, uh, in this case, I'm going to add them only in the degree of freedom, uh, in the first degree of freedom that you can see here, uh, and the second degree of freedom that represents the displacement uh, for the nodes A, B, C, and D. And I'm going to leave everything else as zero as I am not considering it for this analysis. My mass is going to be 200 uh, ton, and I'm going to divide it along or among the four different nodes that are located at the top of this structure. So with this, I am finalizing this video, and that is the definition of the 3D reinforced concrete frame. And then in the next videos, I'm going to do the analysis, um, and I'm going to discuss a few other issues. Thank you.